Good evening. Everybody get your Bibles. Get your Bibles. We're going to be looking at one chapter in the Bible and turn to John, the Gospel of John, chapter number 9. John 9. We've heard a lot about the cancel culture. It's out there. You turn on your TV. There are folks talking about it. Cancel culture. I'm going to cancel you. He has been canceled. We're living in a cancel culture. They tell us on the screen. We're watching it on TV. And since the news media are telling us that we are, and there's people out there telling us that we're living in a cancel color culture, then, then it must be true, right? We are having this cancel culture. And we're in danger of being canceled. Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, I looked it up, and I wanted to know what it meant to be in a cancel culture, to be canceled. And here's what it means. Cancel culture is a form of boycott. It is the removal or canceling of a person, an organization, a product, a brand, or anything else due to an issue that a community or a group disapproves of and finds offensive. And it's believed that Christianity is under a threat. It's under a threat of being canceled by the culture because they're offended by Christianity. And if it offends them, then they'll just look at you and say, that offends me. I counsel you, I boycott you, I put you aside, I remove you. And that's what cancel culture is. Now, John chapter number, this is not new. This is not something that somebody thought of and said, boy, we're going to do this. This is, this is bad. This is how, it's, we've been under threat as Christians, as followers of Christ for many years. And it was happening in John chapter number 9. Let's go to John chapter number 9. This is where Jesus heals a blind man. And it's a great story, but it's more than a story. It's so many lessons in this chapter, but we're going to look at it from the vantage point of these folks are trying to cancel this man and Jesus, his family, and so forth. First of all, the thing that we are going to see is that Jesus is the truth. He is absolute truth. He is the light of the world. He is the one that's coming in saying, I'm here to help you. I'm here to, and we talked about that this morning, how that Jesus is light. God is light. And he introduced Jesus to the world. We are the lights that follow Jesus. And therefore, we're the, we're the answer to the world's problem. Jesus is the answer to the world's problems. But yet, people who walk in darkness don't like the light. And they try to cancel it. But look what happens in verse number 1 of John chapter 9. And I am reading from the King James Version. So whatever translation that you enjoy reading, read along with me. The first eight verses. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from birth. So he's born blind. Verse 2. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. I mean, it must be something really bad. Maybe his parents did a sin, so God cursed him with a, a baby that was born blind. Or maybe he was a sinner uh, before he was even born, maybe. And then God cursed him with a, with a birth of being blind. So, so answer the question. Who did the sin here? Verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but... Here's the reason this man is here, blind since birth. What? That the works of God should be made manifest in him. He is about to glorify God. He is about to do something, something's about to happen to him that's going to bring glory to God. And that's the reason it's all about. We're here to bring light to the world. This man is going to bring light to the world. And I am going to be the facilitator of it. Look at verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me. I'm the light of the world, right? So I've got to glorify God by obeying him. So while it is day, the night comes when no man can work. There's going to become a time when we're not going to glorify God and we're going to be gone. So uh, while I can, I'm going to bring light. Look at verse 5. 
as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So, verse number 6. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, he made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, keep this in mind. The blind man has never seen Jesus. He was born blind. He heard him talk, but he's never laid eyes on him. And then now he's got this mud on his eyes. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation, sent. That's interesting. I'm going to send you to sent. So he sends him to sent. And he went. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and he came seeing. For the first time in this man's life, he was able to see. Nobody could explain to him what the color of blue was right up until this moment. Now he can see blue for the first time. Never seen Jesus at this point, but now he can see. And the neighbors, look at verse 8, Therefore they which before had seen him that he was blind, they recognized it. And they said, Is not this he that sat and begged? That's the only way he could make a living, uh, is to beg for uh, support. Is this not the guy? He was born blind, and now he's seeing. This is amazing. And they're saying, this is something to be thought about. This is something that you can't ignore. This is out there. And Jesus, that's the purpose. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. I want to show people I'm the light of the world. We're going to glorify God. This man is going to be the product of that. This is what it's all about. But there's a group of people in this chapter that don't even care about the light that was just given to this man physically with his eyesight. They don't care about the light that Jesus is bringing to the world. They don't care about any of that. So they are going to cancel this fellow. They're just going to, we're going to cancel you. You're offending us. And because you're offending us and we're offended by Christ, we're offended by what's happened here, we're just going to cancel you. And, and before we cancel you, though, we're going to investigate. And we'll just cancel whatever it is that is involved in this situation. Look at verse number 9. Some said, this is he. Yep, that's the guy that was born blind, begging around town. Others said, no, he is like him. I'm going to cancel. No, you're not the guy. You're, you're like the guy. You look like him. You sound like him, but you're not really him. But he said, I am he. I am the guy. Therefore, verse number 10, said they unto him, How were your eyes open? How is this possible? Well, he answered and he said, in verse number 11, Well, a man that is called Jesus made clay, knowing in my eyes, said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam, wash, and I went, and I washed, and I received my sight. That's the way it happened. Verse 12, Then they said unto him, Well, where is he? He said, I know not, and he didn't. He had no clue where Jesus was. He was sent to go to Siloam. Siloam, who, where's Jesus? I don't know. They brought him to the Pharisees, him that aforetime was blind. Now we're going to get in front of the Pharisees who wants to cancel this guy. It was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. That, that offended these Jews. These Pharisees. It's the Sabbath day. They had a whole list of things that they had made up that you can't do on the Sabbath day. And think about it. He healed a blind man on the Sabbath day. That should have said, wow, the light's on. Amazing. We need to investigate. We need to find out more about the light that has come to the world. But they didn't. All they were worried about is their own set of ideas. They were just worried about being offended. And so again, verse number 15, the Pharisees also asked him, How did you receive your sight? Well, he said to them, Well, he put clay upon my eyes, and I washed, and I see. It's as simple as that. I'm just giving you the facts. It's just as simple as can be. The man put clay on my eyes. He sent me to Siloam. I washed, and now I can see. That's how it happened. Therefore, verse number 16 said, Some of the Pharisees, the ones that wants to cancel the guy, to cancel the offense, cancel Jesus. This man is not of God. What? The man could see, born blind. 
Brought light to the world. Brought light to the man. And now you just make a blanket statement. Jesus is not of God. Period. Because, here's the reason, he offended us. How? He keepeth not the Sabbath day. Now, Jesus is not a sinner. He never sinned. And if he would have not kept the Sabbath day holy, that would have been a sin. One of the Ten Commandments is, you know, keep the Sabbath day holy. Well, Jesus didn't sin by healing this man. It was in their minds. It was in their value system, in their tradition. That's what they said, and that's why they're offended. That's the reason he's not of God. It's because he broke our opinions. Others said, well, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? It just don't make sense to us. He must not be a sinner. And there was a division among them. The people that wanted to cancel Jesus, and then the people that wanted to investigate and was interested in Jesus. Number 17. They said unto the blind man, again, what sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? What do you think? And he said, well, he's a prophet. I, I, I don't know all the details. He certainly don't know about the Son of God issue yet. He don't know, but, but i got to believe that he's a prophet. But, verse 18, the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind. They thought he was lying. You're just a liar. And that's what they do. People that want to cancel you, if they can't cancel you by the facts, they'll cancel you by name calling. Well, you're a liar. You're a racist. You're a homophobe. You're a this. You're a that. And they, they cancel you in that way. So you're a liar. And received his sight until they called his parents unto them that he had received his sight. We don't believe you. We're going to ask somebody in the community that, and, and we're going to verify, but they know what they're doing. If they bring some testifying in, some testimony that can prove that this man was not born blind, then they could cancel him. And they knew they had their thumb on people because if they will, what some religious organizations today call excommunication, they throw you out of the church, you know, uh, they have that power to throw you out of the synagogue. And back then, if you get thrown out of the synagogue, you ain't got a job, you, you can't get a job, you, you, you're, you're just shunned. And, and it's a terrible physical situation as well as an emotional situation as well as a social situation. Nobody wants to be canceled. And so this guy's parents don't want to be canceled. So if they think, if I can threaten canceling them, then maybe they'll tell us that this guy wasn't really born blind. So they put the pressure on other people to cancel you. If they can't cancel you, get somebody else that'll cancel you, and we'll pressure them with a threat of being canceled if they don't get on our side. So look at verse 19. They asked them, the parents, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? Oh, is that, that's just what you said, right? How then doth he now see? You tell me. You get on our side. Otherwise, we're going to cancel you. Now his parents, verse number 20, answered them and said, We know that this is our son. Now that's a fact. We can't deny that fact. And we know what? That he was born blind. That's a fact. Verse 21, But don't cancel us. We're going to acknowledge these facts, but we're not going to go so far Get you, you cancel us. By what means, verse number 21, by what means he now sees? We know not. We have no idea. Or who hath opened his eyes? We know not. We don't know about Jesus. We don't know about any prophet in the community. He is of age. He's old enough. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. So they just, it's a hot potato issue. And instead of standing up for the man, saying, yeah, he was blowing blind and all this, and boy, we're excited that he can now see, and whoever it was that made him see, we're going to see the light too. No, they had the pressure on them. They was afraid to be canceled. They don't want to be canceled. Look at verse 22. These words spake his parents. This is the reason they throw the ball off of themselves and put it back on their boy. Because, here's the reason, they feared the Jews. They were afraid. For the Jews had agreed already before they even interviewed the parents. They had already made up their mind. What? That if any man did confess 
that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. He's going to be canceled. So they'd already made their mind up. So if these parents would have said, we're so happy that our son can see, and we're praising Jesus for giving him the light in his eyes, and we may be thinking that Jesus is the light of the world now. They didn't say none of that. Why? Because they feared. That is the only power that cancel culture has, is the power of fear. And they were afraid. Therefore, said his parents, he's of age, ask him. Verse number 23. Verse number 24. Then again called they the man that was blind, so they got him back on the hot seat. And they said unto him, Give God the praise. We know, we know what? That this man is a sinner. Jesus, they'd already made their mind up. He's a sinner. And we're not, we want to cancel him. And we don't want you to acknowledge that he is from God. Get on our side. Verse number 25. The man answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. I don't know. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, but now I see. Boy, that's some great words, is it not? I once was blind, but now I see. That's what I know. And Jesus is the light of the world. Once we were blind, now we can see. That's what we know. Then, verse number 26, said they to him. This is the Pharisees saying it to the blind guy, or he's no longer blind, the healed guy. What did he to thee? Tell us again. Now he's already told him twice, and he's already told the community, and everybody's talking about it. So they got him back on the hot seat. Tell us again. What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Verse 27, he answered then, I have told you. And that's what you can do to people that want to counsel you, and they want to strike fear in your heart. You tell them, and well, tell us again. You tell them, they tell us again. I've told you. They're not going to listen. They've already made up their minds what they want to believe. They just want to get you to say something that they could discredit. And that's what they're trying to do this fella. And he said in verse 27, I have told you already and you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? You're not listening. Are you even going to listen? Will you also be his disciples? If I keep telling you long enough, will you turn your mind and become a disciple of Christ? Oh, that offended those Jews. Look at verse 28. They reviled him. Don't you even talk like that. And they said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spake unto Moses. For as for this fellow, Jesus, we do not know from where he, whence he is. We don't know where he's from. They're not willing to investigate it. They're not willing to open their minds. Verse 30. The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is? I'm surprised that you don't know where he come from. And yet he hath opened my eyes. You guys are the religious people. You guys are the prophets and the scribes and the Pharisees. You're supposed to know all this stuff. Why don't you know? He opened my eyes, guys. Don't you need to investigate and find out who he is? I'm surprised you don't know who he is. Now, we know that God, verse number 31, heareth not sinners. But if any man is a worshiper of God and doth his will, him he hears. That was the guy's concept. He was the blind guy that was born blind, raised in poverty. He was sitting there begging, and his concept was that God doesn't listen to bad people, and God listens to good people. That's what he believed in his religious system. And so, uh, you Pharisees been teaching me that all my life, that God doesn't listen to bad people. God listens to good people. So, he certainly listened to this man who healed me. So, he must not be a bad person. So, he's, he's actually teaching the Pharisees. He's trying to tell them a philosophy and a logical statement. Since the world began, he went on to say in verse 32, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? Heard a lot about people getting healed of being blind, but anybody born blind? Nobody's done that since the world began. If this man were not of God, this is what the blind guy who was healed is teaching these Pharisees, if this guy was not of God, he could do nothing, right? That's the logical thing. And they answered him and said unto him, listen, verse 34, they're so offended, 
They're so upset. They've already made up their minds to cancel Jesus. Here's what they said. You were all together born in sin. Why? Because you was born blind. If you were born blind, you must be a sinner. Whether it's your parents or whether it's you, you were born in sin. And dost thou teach us? You're trying to explain to us that we should accept Jesus? Is that what you're trying to do? You're a sinner. We're not. We're Pharisees. We're scribes. And look what they did in verse number 34. They cast him out. They canceled him. They wanted to cancel Jesus. That's what the whole issue is. They couldn't stand him. They were offended by him. Anything that he stood for, they were against now, Jesus heard about that. Look at verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. They had canceled this guy. He now has all kinds of problems socially, problems with the community, problems that we can't even imagine what he's going to have to go through. But they canceled him. Now, Jesus heard that they had canceled him. Verse number 35. And when he had found him, Jesus went and found the guy. He said unto him, Do you believe on the Son of God? I've just got that one question for you, fella. Well, in verse 36, the guy answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? I don't know who he is. He's never seen Jesus. He's heard his voice. Maybe he recognized. I don't know. But we know one thing, the guy's still trying to comprehend what had happened to him. He's trying to comprehend the Son of God, the concept of the Son of God. And Jesus asked him, do you believe in the Son of God? And he said, well, who is he? So that I can believe him. I've got an open mind. I'm not wanting to cancel it just because it offends me. If it's the truth, I want to know it, and I will obey the truth. And Jesus said in verse 37, Thou hast both seen him... And it is he that's talking with you. In other words, Jesus is saying, it's me. I'm the Son of God. You're looking at me. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. He worshipped him. Now think about that. He worshipped Jesus. Anybody that receives worship other than God is, is blasphemy. But Jesus had no problem receiving that worship because he is God. He didn't blaspheme at all. And the fellow fell down and worshipped Jesus. Why? Because he is the Son of God. He is worthy to be worshipped. He is the light of the world. He accepted that truth regardless of the society that canceled him. I don't care about that. I care about you. And Jesus said in verse number 39, For judgment I am coming to the world. You people are pointing your finger at me. This, this person who, who drew this, I thought that was pretty good. Uh, that's what people do to us. They point their finger at us. You're this, you're that, you offend us. We don't like what you stand for. And here's what Jesus did. He stood up to them. He said, you're not canceling me. You can't cancel Jesus. 2,000 plus years later, we're still talking about Jesus and what he did for this man, and we don't know those guys' names. These guys are completely gone from historical records. They were canceled. They canceled themselves is what they did. When you refuse to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and you are offended by everything that Jesus stands for, and you try to cancel Jesus out of people's lives, you're canceling yourselves. Look at verse number 39. He says, For judgment I am come into this world, but they which see not might see. See, I am come here not for rejection. I, I'm not here to cancel anybody. Not here at all to cancel anybody. Now these religious figures, society, they're offended and they just want to reject you. They just want to cancel you. Jesus said, I'm not come to reject anybody. I'm not come to cancel anybody. I'm not come with a cancel culture. I'm coming with a Christ culture. And my culture is reconciliation. Read that again. 
for judgment I am come into this world that, what? They which see not might see. That's my purpose. It's for reconciliation. But unfortunately, that they which see might be made blind. Those people think they see it. They think they got it. They think they know all the answers. They cancel themselves when they do that. Now some of the Pharisees, in verse number 40, which were with him, heard these, th these words. And they said unto him, Are we blind also? Are you accusing us of being blind? And here's what Jesus said. Verse 41. If you were blind, if you recognized your spiritual blindness, is what he's trying to tell them there. You should have no sin. You would get it. You would have the light in your life because you recognize your spiritual blindness. And when I am the light of the world and I came and bring God's light into the world, you will have your eyes open. You will be able to see. You won't be blind anymore if you recognize your spiritual blindness. But he goes on to say, but now you say, we see. We're not spiritually blind. We see. Because you say that, therefore, your sin remains. You have just canceled yourself. Now, a lot of people might look at that and say, well, you know, isn't that the same thing as disfellowship from the church? You know, Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when this guy was in the church and he was doing a bad thing, and Paul says, well, purge him out. Don't eat with him. Don't drink with him. Don't have association with him. Isn't that canceling him? No. Why? Because in 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, he said, forgive him. Bring him back. The point is, discipline in the church is not canceling anybody. They've already canceled themselves. Think about that. If somebody comes up and they have left Jesus and they're out of the, they are canceling themselves. Church discipline is to reconcile them. We want you back. We don't want you to be out there in the world. We don't want you to be blind. We want you to see. So we're going to exercise church discipline to, to help reconcile you, to help you see that you're blind. That's what Jesus, you wanna, you're blind. If you could see your blindness, Pharisees, then you would be saved. Your sins would be forgiven. I just want you to see your blindness. And that's what church discipline is all about, to help people be reconciled. Not to reject them. Unfortunately, the Corinthians thought it was about rejection and they kicked the guy out because they were Jewish. A lot of them were. Some of them were Gentiles. But that, that's what their concept is of casting out of the synagogue, casting him out of the church, maybe the same thing. So all we did is reject the guy. Jesus says, you don't get it. Paul said, you're not getting it. Cancel culture is to reject you. Christ culture is to reconcile you to himself. Do not let the cancel culture try to cancel you. Just understand one thing, and it's so sad. They're canceling themselves when they're attempting to cancel you. You cannot cancel Jesus. Jesus said, I've come to build my church. I'm going to build my church. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. You can't cancel the church. But they use these fear tactics to try to make you afraid. And there's people that come up all the time, especially in maybe the political world, maybe in the movies in the Hollywood world or whatever. As soon as they get a little cancellation on them, they'll jump up in front of a microphone and a, and a film and a camera and they'll say, oh, we apologize. Oh, we're so sorry. Please don't cancel us. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus said, you canceling yourself. He didn't Bow down to the fear of it. Don't allow the world to cancel you. They can't. Oh, there may be some social problems. There may be some uh, financial problems. There may be some earthly problems if they do attempt to cancel you. But refuse to be canceled by the world. And whatever you do, do not be canceled by Christ on the last day through rejection because that's what will happen. On the last day, he's going to separate us all and he's going to say, you guys did what's right 
You guys were the light of the world. You went and helped people. You did all these things. Wonderful for you. You, you obeyed the gospel. You didn't allow the society to cancel you. Enter into the joys of the world. But you guys over here, I know you not. You allowed the world to cancel you. So, these guys will be saved. These guys will be lost. Do not let that happen. And it's our choice. If you're here tonight, you've never been baptized into Christ, the Bible teaches it. You've seen the plan of salvation multiple times. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, live faithfully. Do that. Be the light of the world. And when people point their finger at you and they say, you're offending me, just understand they're canceling themselves in the eyes of Christ. Obey the gospel. Open your eyes. See the light. Why don't you come? Why together we stand and sing?